Okay, welcome to the Homotopy Type Theory Electronic Seminar Talks. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, um, feel free to subscribe to our channel. We do have a YouTube channel. But if you want up to the minute information on type theory, you should tune in live next time and get the uh, talk in real time. Um, this week's speaker is Dan Licata from Wesleyan University, and his title is A Vibrational Framework for Substructural and Modal Dependent Type Theories. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, and thanks to you and to Chris for uh, allowing me to give a talk here. I'm happy to talk to all of you. So what I want to talk about today is joint work with Mitchell Riley, who's a PhD student here at Wesleyan, and Mike Schulman. And before I can tell you about like what a framework is and why we, we're interested in it, I want to start with a bit of motivation about uh, what modalities are and why we care about them. So you may know some of this work in HOT recently using this idea of axiomatic cohesion due to Laverre. And the idea there is that you might consider a category of spaces and a category of sets and then some adjoint functors between them, like the functor that sends a space to its underlying set of points. And then if you think of the space as being equipped with some topology or stickiness or paths or something like that, then you can come back up uh, discreetly, which means that you don't stick anything together, or co-discreetly, which means you stick everything together. And then there's a uh, connected components functor that sends each space to the set of connected components. And this has recently been generalized to an infinity categorical version, where you think about infinity groupoids with some extra structure up here, and you think about infinity groupoids or hot down here, and then you have the same kinds of things. Except here, a nice thing that happens is that the pi is what's called the fundamental infinity groupoid, which means that, for example, the uh, discrete topological infinity groupoid on the set of connected components really becomes the full, it's not just the set of connected components, it's the full structure there. So what you have is kind of the space where you've turned all the topological paths into homotopy structure. And so Mike Schulman had this paper, Real Cohesive Hot, where you can define a topological S1 that's built out of the actual circle and use this uh, idea of shape to turn it into the actual S1. And so this kind of, because of this idea of cohesion, there's been a lot of interest in these operations where you would have sort of two notions of types, the types that live up here or the and the types that live down here and a bunch of functors between them with some adjunctions. Um, now, because these are full and faithful coming up here, you can switch your perspective and think about only having the types that live in the top, that is the topological things, the things equipped with extra structure, not just the basic hot structure. And then the modalities become uh, endofunctors on that category. So you would have a thing called flat and a thing called sharp and a thing called shape, where those are composites of the picture from the previous slide. And because of the way in which these things are composites of the previous slide, you end up things with, with things like flat's a co-monad and sharp's a monad, and uh, they're both idempotent because they're both uh, both of the ways of coming back up are full and faithful, and and that's a monad. And so, these are examples of what have historically in modal logic been called modalities, which are endofunctors on types or propositions. And so, people have talked about things like the necessity or possibility modalities in modal logic or the exponentials in linear logic are examples of these that have been studied. So there's lots of different kinds of cohesion. So for example, uh, there's work by Urs Schreiber and Felix Wallen's thesis is uh, extending this, where you take this triple of modalities that we had down here on the previous slide and then add another layer. And the idea is that you use that other layer to represent uh, some sort of notion of differentiability and get that in the picture. And then there's another layer that uh, Urs talked about at the modal hot workshop at CME last week where you have another layer on top here that gives you some other super homotopy theory or something like that. And so there's a bit of a project at the hot MRC in Utah a couple summers ago where we were trying to make a type theory analogous to the type theory for these modalities that also included these modalities. And then there's some other applications of cohesion, like uh, Eric Finster was visiting here uh, a couple of years ago, and we thought about a type theory for parameterized spectra. The idea being there that you have a space in the base, and then a single type or a single context really represents a space in the base with a family of types over it, where those families are spectra, that is infinite loop spaces, and then, and are pointed, 
And then there's a way to see that the flat and the sharp of cohesion become the same modality in this setting. And what they do is they, so you have a self-adjoint idempotent monad and comonad. And what they do is they kind of kill the spectrum that's sitting above all the points and replace it with a trivial one. So that's sort of a different setting that has the same kinds of modalities, but uh, has some different properties there. And then there's other places where cohesion has come up recently, like universes and cubicle models. So uh, when you look at the approach to defining cubicle models via internal languages uh, in work by Ian Orton, Andy Pitts, and Boss Spitters and other people, uh, then you, to describe universes in that, you can use the cohesion to get access to external statements inside the pre-sheaved topos. And so we use that to give axioms for a universe. Um, in the work on parametricity, so there's this uh, work by uh, these people on bridge path cubicle sets parametricity, where you have cohesion with a further right adjoint. There's work by, uh, in the work that Evan talked about uh, in the last hottest, there was the setting had kind of a cubicle type theory with two kinds of intervals. And so you get some uh, different kind of cohesion there because you can forget one thing or forget the other. And then that's similar to work on the bisimplicial and bicubical directed type theories. So the bisimplicial one by Real Shulman, Emily talked about in one of the first hottest. And then uh, I've been working with a student on a bicubical variant of that. And we're using some of the cohesion that comes up there, which is again, coming from the fact that there's pre sheaves on two different categories and you can forget one or forget the other. Uh, Alex Cavas has done some work on information flow security using cohesion in classified sets, which is where you have a set equipped with a bunch of reflexive relations. So that's just to kind of tick off the fact that there's a whole bunch of applications of this idea of cohesion. And in all of these different applications, what happens is that you get different, slightly different structures to all of these modalities. And then when we think about the concept of modality in general, there's a whole area of proof theory and programming languages, which I would say is mostly simply typed, not dependent type theory where you consider different sorts of things. So in the context of dependent types specifically, there's things like the bang comonad and linear logic and the dependent versions of that. There's things like squash types and bracket types, which are the ancestors of propositional truncation, which are modalities in a certain sense. Um, there's a recent work on dependent right adjoints generalizing the sharp operation of uh, spatial type theory cohesion to uh, kind of subtract some other properties of that and give a more general calculus. And there's work recently using the later modality and guarded recursion in a dependently typed context. And so in general, the picture I want you to kind of have in your mind is that there's all these different situations where you have all these different, slightly different modalities running around. And so the goal of this work is really to get a handle on what are kind of the fundamental principles that would allow us to design type theories for these different situations without kind of doing each one in a case by case basis and having to think through each one individually and do hard work each time. So what I wanna do first is to talk sort of more generally about the patterns in type theories with modalities in a very, very simple setting. And then after that, I'll tell you about the framework that we've designed that kind of codifies these patterns into a type theory where you can describe these different type theories. Okay, so first of all, I'll boot up on what are type theories with modalities. So you might think of modalities as being like, that word might denote to you monadic modalities in Bukhat, meaning a type circle satisfying some stuff. And so what we'd now do is we'd call that an idempotent modad monadic modality because it's just one particular kind of modality among all of the modalities we might run into. So for example, when I had that picture of cohesion at the beginning, sharp and shape turn out to be a monadic modality, but the flat operation, the discrete retopologization is not. And so uh, the reason that you can give axioms for the monadic modalities is essentially because terms in type theory have many variables but one conclusion. So it's easy to control the conclusion. And so what I mean by that is that the universal property for mapping out of a monadic modality says that maps from the modality into any modal conclusion are the same as maps from A into the modal conclusion, precomposing with the unit there. 
And so the fact here is that you're saying that the conclusion, the single conclusion is modal, is what allows you to apply this operation. When we come to co-monadic modalities, on the other hand, then internal definitions don't work, and instead you need new rules to control the use of the context. So if you think about the introduction form for a co-monadic modality, then the new rules have two kinds of contexts, and you should think of this part of the context here, hopefully you can see my pointer there, um, as secretly having a flat on it that is secretly being modal. So what this rule says is that if you have a map from a secretly flat part of the context into A, then you get a map from that secretly flat part of the context into flat A, which is the dual of this, which said to map from circle A into circle B, you map from A into circle B. Here we're saying to map from flat delta into A, you map from flat delta into flat A. Sorry, to map from flat delta into flat A, you can map from flat delta into A. But so the reason you need new rules is that here you need to control all of the things in the context, which you can't do by an internal statement in the type theory. Whereas when the modality is on the other side in the conclusion, you can control the one conclusion by just uh, doing what you do when you do these modalities in book hot. So the idea here is that you can give new rules and these new rules denote something about the modality. So for example, we intend flat to be a co-monad and this rule here, which allows you to use a special modal variable over here as an A, is kind of secretly the co-unit, because if you think about there being a secret flat from the fact that it's on this side of the dividing line, then this is going from flat A to A. And then the operation here is like the co-bind of the co-monad and uh, involves the co-multiplication, as does the substitution principle here. And it's not going to be important for the rest of the talk that you understand exactly the notation of these rules. We'll kind of come back to instances of them as we go. But the point is just like, you need to make up some new rules and add them to the syntax of your type theory in order to describe this situation. And there's additional subtleties when you come to dependent types, like how should the flat type depend? And it turns out that for the real cohesive hot application that where these were used, the way that flat should depend is like this, which says that flat A only depends on the flat variables of the context. Okay, so that's a particular example of adding a co-monadic modality to type theory by putting in new rules that describe it. And when we come to uh, think about other types, even though monadic modalities can be axiomatized in the way you might be familiar with from the hot book, it's still sometimes fruitful to define monadic modalities via new rules in the type theory, and then prove that it satisfies the idempotent monadic modality axioms from the hot book, rather than defining it to be a postulated modality that satisfies those axioms. So for example, Mike's rules for sharp in spatial type theory essentially define it in such a way that flat is left adjoint to sharp, and such that uh, flat sharp is flat, which are properties that you happen to want. This one comes from the, uh, well, okay, which are properties that you happen to want there. And so you kind of define it with rules that make these true, and then you prove that it satisfies the modality axioms. So the way you can see the adjunction coming up here is, for example, this says that to map into sharp A, what you do is you move all of the non-modal assumptions over into the context that secretly has a flat on it. And so this is saying that a map from gamma into sharp A is the same as a map from flat gamma into A. And the delta stays in the same place here because we're talking about an idempotent monad. So if we get a secret flat on top of a secret flat, that's the same as one secret flat. And so then the elimination rule is saying that if you have a uh, term of type sharp A that mentions only the flat variables, that's the same as a flat sharp A. And so you're going from flat sharp A to flat A in the conclusion and so on. And so then when you come to dependency, there's things like how does the sharp type depend? And this gets to do the same thing to the context that the intro rule does here, which is to say that when you're forming a sharp type, then 
it's enough to assume that all of the variables in your context are the special modal flatted variables here. And this is a judgmental way of doing that. And then if you look at Mike's paper on Brouwer's fixed point theorem in real cohesive hot, he shows that this is a pretty nice usable system. There was a project at the uh, Utah math research communities a couple of summers ago about doing some, so Mike did the Brouwer fixed point theorem. I think at the summer they did the Harry Ball theorem and Borsak Ulam and some other things shows that this is a nice setting for doing some topology where in the topology you use some synthetic homotopy theory as a lemma. Okay, so that's the idea of putting in modalities via new rules. And so now it's not the case that every modality should come up via new rules in the sense that in real cohesive hot shape, that uh, shape modality is supposed to be a nullification. In particular, it's supposed to kill maps from R. That is, it's supposed to make A to the embedding of the constant functions A to uh, R arrow A and equivalents. And so you wouldn't expect to do that by rules of a type theory, or at least I wouldn't, because when you're doing that, you're sort of giving it a universal property relative to an existing type, like the Dedekind real numbers. And that's not the kind of things that rules would usually do. So in that kind of thing, like shape or truncations or things like that, you wanna keep the normal perspective that you can define things that satisfy the modality definition internally to hot, but sometimes you wanna put in some judgmental modalities. So when it comes to putting in judgmental modalities, there's a lot of work in the proof theory community on different kinds of substructural or modal logics, and I'll explain what substructural means in a second. And the kinds of things that people use to do this are multiple kinds of assumptions or multi-zone contexts or tree-structured contexts or judgments with multiple modes or a vibrational perspective. And so um, what we want to do is to kind of, what I want to do next is kind of explain sort of, if you're a proof theorist or a substructural logician or a modal logician, what is it that you do to design a new logic or type theory for a particular setting? And the recipe that we'll kind of come back to for the rest of the talk is that when you want to consider a particular situation, what you do is you add a new form of judgment for the left adjoints. And then the left adjoint types have a left universal property relative to that judgment. And the right adjoint types have a right universal property to relative to that judgment. And then what I'll call the structural rules are given as equations, natural isomorphisms, or natural transformations between contexts. And that gives you kind of a basic type theory that you can start from. And then the interesting part in some sense of designing such a type theory is optimizing the placement of the structural rules. Okay, so that's a lot. So let me give an example that hopefully will make that concrete. So suppose we wanna talk about type theory for a monoidal product, meaning just a monoid. What do we do? Well, the first thing we do is we put in a new judgment, which is the fact that context can be combined with a comma, right? So if you think of context as not coming with any constructors a priori, right? Like we don't necessarily say that contexts are lists or contexts are sets of maps from variable names to types or something like that. We just think of them as an algebraic structure. Then the new judgment is the comma. And the monoidal products are the left adjoint, meaning that what you say is that anytime you have a context that somewhere in it has the product A tensor B, then that's the same as, maps out of that are the same as maps out of the context where you've replaced the type with the comma. And then when you have a right adjoint, the way you would say a right adjoint to this, is that you give it a right universal property relative to the same kind of new judgment, which is this context, saying that a map into a lollipop B, which you th should think of as the home that's adjoint to that uh, product, is the same as a map in context gamma comma A to B. Okay, so that's kind of saying that a monoidal product is coming from putting in the new context operation and then giving types that have left and right universal properties relative to it. And so where do you get the monoid rules? Well, for example, if comma is associative, then so is the type. And so the way that you prove that is that 
you would use the universal mapping property to say, oh, I'm trying to map out of this association of the type that's the same as mapping out of that. And then you would use the thing again to say, well, I'm trying to map out of this part, the BC, and so I can turn that into a comma. And then I'm trying to go from here to here, where I've replaced this type formula with a context here. And at that point, what you do is you reassociate the context, which can either be a, a quality or an isomorphism, depending on how you're thinking about things. And then once you've reassociated the context, then there's a canonical map uh, given from a comma B to introduce the tensor, a tensor B, and there's the identity over there. So the way that people design these type theories is that the type itself doesn't have equations or isomorphisms like the associativity. You reduce the type to the judgment structure like this state, and then you use the equations or isomorphisms on the judgment structure here. So that's an idea of having structural rules for a connective. And so what I mean by optimization is that if you think about the way people present a type theory for a monoids, this comes up in ordered logic, which is a special case of linear logic, then what happens is that you pick a canonical associativity for the context. That's what what, why you say that contexts are lists. You're really picking a canonical associativity for the monoid. And so then you take the primitive rule that says that gamma comma AB turns into gamma comma A comma B together like that. And you optimize it by combining it with a structural rule saying that, well, I'm going to pick maybe the canonical association is that the context is left associated. So once I do this move, which is the real principle for turning this type into this judgment, then you apply a structural rule to get to this. And then that's sort of what you would expect, which is that when you, when you represent context as lists. So that's an idea of the idea of optimizing the inference rules by combining them with structural rules. So if you, uh, we'll do it, let's do another example before we get to a modal example. If you want to describe a Cartesian product in this way, then you have the same kinds of judgments, that is you have a comma in the context, but you give it some additional structural rules. And whereas before we would think of the, uh, the structural rule of associativity as an equation or an isomorphism, sometimes these will be natural transformations. So for example, to make the context comma Cartesian, one way to do it is that you put in a weakening or a projection that goes from any context to the empty set, and you put in a, a contraction which goes from any context to the pair judgmentally of that context with itself. And then you would have these rules, which are sort of the natural ones for any old product is you would have, well, the identity is part of the type theory, and then you can map from gamma comma delta into A cross B if you can map from gamma to A and delta to B. And so then the optimization here is the part where you observe that the uh, theory of a Cartesian monoid, in fact, gives you a Cartesian product. So for example, the way you get from this to the rules you might be familiar with from simple type theory is that you say that I can always weaken at the leaves, right? So I can always put a projection at the leaves of the derivation, go from gamma x colon a to x colon a, and because of that, I might as well contract every time I have a rule with multiple premises. So I'm gonna duplicate my, right? So like relative to this rule, this rule says, I have to split my context into some stuff that goes towards A and some stuff that goes towards B. Here I'm saying I can send everybody towards both A and B. That's an instance of contraction to turn the gamma delta into, uh, to turn a single gamma into gamma gamma. And the reason that it's okay to do that is that if I end up with extra stuff at the top, then I can just forget about it at the top. And so substructural logics are ones where you don't have associativity or uh, unit laws or uh, exchange that is commutativity or this weakening or contraction that is these projections and duplication. And so in those, you have to be more careful about where the structural rules go, but here you can do the usual thing as an optimization. Okay, so now I wanna see how the same story applies to flat in spatial type theory, that is in a very special case of uh, flat in simple type theory. So if we tell the same story, which is that we're gonna add a new form of judgment for left adjoints, 
the left adjoint types have a left universal property, the right adjoint types have a right universal property, and then we'll have some structural rules, which are equations, natural isomorphisms, or natural transformations between contexts, and then we do some optimization. How does that play out for flat? Well, the new form of context I'll write as f of gamma, where you should read f as sort of the judgmental thing that corresponds to flat. And then the universal property for the left adjoint is that the type flat A maps into C is the same as the context F of A mapping into C. And the same for the right adjoint is saying that gamma maps into sharp A, remember sharp A is supposed to be the right adjoint to flat, is the same as the flatted context, right, F of gamma mapping into B. Okay, so that's the picture here is that we've added this new kind of context and then we've said that flat turns into that context on the left and sharp turns into that context on the right. And so because of that, putting these two together, you can see that we get the adjunction between flat and sharp by way of this state where you're, uh, oh, sorry, the typo here, that should be a, a, I guess, in this notation. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, gamma into A, the B here should be an A. Okay, and so you get the adjunction here by composing these two things together. So if you want to get flat, well, flat's supposed to be a co-monad, then the next thing you need to do is you need to say that I can go from F of gamma to gamma, so that's gonna be the co-unit of the co-monad, and I can do a co-multiplication, which is going from F of gamma to two Fs of gamma. And because it's idempotent, we're gonna say that the co-multiplication and the co-unit together, F of the co-unit, give you an isomorphism there. Okay, so that's the structure we want to put in. And so that's kind of an algebraic description of uh, the flat and spatial type theory, right? We have this new way of making contexts, F of gamma, and then flat goes like that, and sharp goes like that. And we have these substitutions representing the co-unit and the co-multiplication, just like you might put in substitutions for projection from a context extension when you're doing dependent type theory. And so now we can think of the rules that we saw before for flat as optimizations of these rules, meaning that when you come to the rule that says, if I have a bunch of special variables and some non-special variables, then I can conclude A if A is in the special modal context. Then what that's doing is, first of all, it's picking a canonical associativity, associativity of contexts, that is placements of this operation F, in the simply type case, one simple thing that works is that you can say that you're gonna read this whole context as read the bar here as an F here, which is to say you have all of these things flatted together with this. And then if you wanna map from that to A, how do you do it? Well, one thing you could do is first do a bunch of projection to kill the gamma, project that away, kill delta, kill delta prime, project that away to get to a modal A, and then you can use the co-unit to get to A itself. And so we're implementing this rule here as a composition of more primitive things, including the structural rules that we've put in for contexts here. And then we have a similar kind of story, which is that when you consider the rule for mapping into a flat type from a bunch of secretly flat variables, then the way that that works is that well, what's happening here is that you're keeping these things flat. And the reason that you can do that is that you might as well use the co-multiplication as you go up through this rule because you can always co-unit later. And if you do that, the co-multiplication and then end up, end up wanting to have, do a co-unit later, then that's the same as not doing that round trip by one of the triangle equalities of the adjunction. Um, okay, so that, yeah. Okay. So what we've seen is this pattern of adding a new form of judgment for left adjoints, giving the left adjoint types a left universal property relative to that judgment, giving the right adjoint types a right universal property relative that, to that judgment, adding structural rules as equations or isomorphisms or natural transformations on contexts, and then using that to optimize the placement of the structural rules. And we've seen that for different kinds of things like these substructural products, like the products in linear logic or ordered logic. We've seen it for one particular modality, a pair of modalities, flat and sharp. 
And so that's, of course, not only part of the story. So for example, we haven't talked about the fact that when you have two different modalities, and from my point of view, both the comma and the flat, that is both the products that you have in the context and the flat operation are modalities of a certain sort, you have to ask, well, does flat preserve products? And so would you get that these two things are equal or not? So there's things like that that come up. When you get to dependency, there's still these issues of how do things work with dependent types? And when you uh, have dependent types, there's of course interactions with identity types and inductive types and hits. There's questions about universes, stability under substitution, whether these types are vibrant, all that kind of great stuff. But the thing that we've been working on is to develop a general account of this pattern of putting in a new context structure and giving types left and right universal properties relative to that context structure by turning the pattern into a framework. And so um, we've been developing the germ of this was in a paper uh, called A Judgmental Deconstruction of Modal Rog Logic by Jason Reed. And then we've been developing uh, that idea since in a series of papers here, culminating in currently a dependently typed framework that's in progress, though I'll tell you something about it before the end of the talk. And this is also, the ideas here are also what Mike Schulman talked about in his hottest last year or last semester or whenever that was. So you can watch that for more on this, the semantic side here. So the sense of framework that I mean here is that in the sense of a logical framework, which is uh, the idea of a type theory where other type theories are specified by signatures. So you should think of signatures as like constants and equations of some sort for some kind of thing. And you want to describe a type theory like that. And the reason you might want to do this is that, for example, if you have a logical framework, then you can use that to implement one proof assistant for a number of type theories by viewing all of those type theories as theories in the framework. And another thing you can do is you can uh, maybe think about doing semantics that is proving initiality for a class of type theories all at once. And so what we've been working on is a modal framework. And the goals we have for it are that, for example, we'd like it to cover a lot of examples because we've had these different situations of real cohesion and uh, differential cohesion and super homotopy theory and uh, cohesion in spectra and all of these kinds of things. We want to have all of those fit into the framework. We'd like it to be easy to go from the intended semantics to a signature that is a description of the type theory inside of the framework. We'd like to have the fact that you write down a signature automatically give you some type theoretic rules so that you don't have to work so hard and be clever to come up with, well, these are the rules you should have for flat and these are the rules you should have for sharp. And what I think we can get in general and what we've gotten in the simply type case in past work is that you don't get the fancy optimized rules that we saw before where you combine the structural rules with the other rules in an interesting way, like saying that, well, I know it's a Cartesian product, therefore I can only project at the leaves and I can contract every time I go up into a rule with multiple premises. What we get is more like the rules with explicit structural rules, but you can use the framework to derive the optimized rules. That is, you can prove them, but which optimized rules you should consider as sufficient requires some cleverness on the part of the person doing the constructions. And another goal of this is that we can do the categorical semantics for the whole framework at once. So this would be a way to prove initiality ultimately for a whole bunch of modal dependent type theories all at once. And hopefully we'll be able to find the expected structures as models of the particular signatures. So when I write down the definitions inside the framework that give me normal dependent type theory, or when I write down the definitions inside the framework that give me flat and sharp or something like that, then I would hope that you can, for example, show that a comprehension category is a model of the theory of the signature for normal dependent type theory and show that the models of uh, uh, real cohesion that come up in sheaves on something are actually models of the signature for uh, real cohesion and so on. Okay, so, and then the final bit would be if we kind of think of this as a tool for implementing proof assistance, uh, one can dream that we could have a proof assistant with enough automation that it would be convenient enough to write down the stuff in the framework and then use that as the implementation of these different type theories. So that's the big picture goal of all of this work. 
So how does this work? I'm going to try to give you a sketch. And some of this is still work in progress. And some of this I'll be a little bit uh, kind of uh, loose about because to actually show you the details of how all of this works through this series of three papers that we've written now would take more than the 25 minutes that I have. But hopefully you can get a feeling through this for how the type three that we're designing encodes this pattern that we've been talking about. So the setup for the framework is called vibrational because it consists of two type theories. You have a top type theory and a base type theory. And the way to think about this is that the top type theory, you should think of as the types and terms of a modal type theory. And the base type theory, you should think of as algebraic syntax for the judgments of that type theory. And you know, I'll do examples, so hopefully this be, will become concrete. But what that means formally is that in our dependently typed framework, both the top and the bottom are dependent type theories. So the top has a notion of context, the top has a notion of type, the top has a notion of uh, terms of a type, the bottom has a notion of context, the bottom has a notion of type that we'll call mode, and the bottom has a notion of terms of a type. And the vibrational point of view is that each judgment in the top lives over a corresponding judgment in the bottom. That is, the judgment of being a context is relative to a mode context. The judgment of being a type is indexed by a mode type. And the judgment of being a term is indexed by a mode term. OK. The reason for this is that when we have a judgment in the top, so x is in A, y is in B, z is in C, d colon d. It's going to live over a corresponding judgment term in the base. So this is a term in the top. It's going to live over a term in the base. And what's going to happen is that these contexts here will behave just like the normal context that you're used to from standard dependent type theory. And if you're thinking, well, in a modal or substructural type theory, the context doesn't behave like the normal context, right? We have these special variables. And when you're proving something of type, constructing a term of type flat A, I'm only allowed to use the special variables. The place where that's enforced is by this part. So these will behave normally, but the base will encode the modal structure of the context via an algebraic signature that tells you what the grammar of contexts is. So we're separating the ambient framework context from the grammar for the modalities there. OK, so how does that work? Well, a semantic intuition for this is that you can think of the base contexts as categories. You can think of the base substitutions as functors. And you can think of the base uh, is going to have a notion of what we call a two cell as natural transformations. So in the base, in addition to contexts and substitutions, there's going to be a separate notion of two cell, which will come up in a second, which will be natural transformations. So you should think of stuff in the base as drawing a diagram in cat. And then you think of contexts or closed types upstairs as representing objects of the category that they're over. And you think of uh, maps or terms upstairs as representing maps from, well, if this is a functor from gamma to delta, and this is an object of gamma, then f of gamma is an object of delta. And so we can consider maps from that to that. OK, so why is this a good thing to consider? Well, if you think about trying to put in spatial type theory, that is this flat and sharp that are adjoint, we're going to try to do that by representing the judgments for the left adjoints by modes and mode terms. And we're going to represent the structural rules by these two cells. That is, we're going to use this to diagram out the extra structure that we want for spatial type theory. And so when we add a judgment for the left adjoint, in the particular case of spatial type theory, the situation is we happen to want a category, which I'll write as P, and then an adjunction uh, between P and itself, flat left adjoint to sharp, where one of them's a comonad and the other's a monad. And so if you think of drawing a picture of that in cat using this base type theory, 
then what that looks like is we say that P is a mode and there's a shape of context F that goes from P to P where P is a mode means that P is a category and there's a shape of context F that goes from P to P means that F is a functor. And then to say that this is a co-monad, we're gonna say that we have natural transformations for the co-unit and the co-multiplication and the equations. Okay, and if the syntax is a little hard to get at first glance, then you can just think of it as, I'm drawing a picture in cat of one category with a functor, which is a co-monad. And so then what we do is, right, so this is giving you kind of the bare structure of putting this left adjoint modality onto the context. But before we can talk about spatial type theory in a dependently typed context, we need to talk about how to represent just regular old dependent contexts. And so for that, what we're gonna do is we're going to represent dependent contexts by kind of giving internal to the base type theory of our framework a signature for the structure of dependent contexts. Well, what is the structure of dependent context? It consists of a mode P that is a category P, which we'll think of as context. And for each context in P, a uh, mode of types dependent on that context. And then we'll think of two cells. Remember, there's a notion of two cell on every type in our framework as representing substitutions in this diagram. And so then what we want to give the signature of an algebraic description of context for dependent type theory is to say something like, for example, given a context and a type dependent on that context, there's an algebraic operation that says a dot x is another context. And then, for example, we'd want a substitution that says if you have a context and you have a type dependent on that context, then there's a projection that goes from uh, a extended with that type to A. So these are axioms in our base type theory that give a particular structure to the context. And then there's more stuff that you wanna say, like for example, you wanna have the fact that you can use variables and some equations and things like that. And so one way to package all of this up is to say that a comprehension object on a type P and a type T dependent on it is a uh, mode term that for each context gives you what you can think of as a unit type in that context, such that the map from P to the sigma of P and T has a right adjoint. Okay, and so this is an, the idea of comprehension due to Laverre passed through an idea by uh, Erhard about reformulating it. So Laverre formulated it in the context of a bifibration, and this is a reformulation that works in any fibration, which is the setting we're in here. And so this notion of Erhard comprehension or a comprehension object, well, okay, we want to be able to remember find naturally occurring uh, categorical structures as models of these kinds of signatures. It turns out that for us, it's easier to use a comprehension object than a category with families or a contextual category or something like that. But we can show that a comprehension category, uh, well, okay, sorry, I'm skipping ahead a little. Uh, the first thing is, why does this give us the right notion? Well, if you spell out what this right adjoint means, it tells you that maps from A into B dot X are the same as maps from A to B together with a term in a certain sense from A to the pullback of X along this map here, which is the comprehension principle that you would expect for uh, a substitution into an extended context independent type theory. And because of that, we can think of this notion of comprehension object as saying that uh, determining a comprehension category. So from a comprehension object, you can make a comprehension category where this is the projection from uh, the sigma or the comprehension of P and T. And then if you have a full comprehension category with the unit object terminal, then it has comprehension. And that's because if it's full and the uh, unit object is terminal, then maps in the fiber from the unit object to any other object are the same as sections of the projection from uh, it, ex the context extension. So we can make one of these from a full comprehension object, full comprehension category, sorry. Okay, so now that we've set up the mode theory for this stuff, the question is how do we represent dependent type theory? 
And so the idea is that when you have a judgment like this of dependent type theory, then upstairs you're going to have something that has sort of the same shape. X has a type, Y has a type, Z has a type, D has a type. Downstairs, you're going to have something that uses the algebraic structure that we just talked about to track the dependencies. So when you have this judgment in ordinary type theory, the dependencies are of the form A depends on nothing, B depends on X, C depends on X and Y, uh, D depends on X, Y, and Z, and uh, sorry, this is, should be D. Um, D also depends on X, Y, and Z. And so this is kind of the pattern of dependency in normal dependent type theory is that everything depends on everything that came before it exactly once in a certain sense and in a linear fashion like this. And so when we get to uh, a modal type theory like spatial type theory, we're going to have a different pattern of dependency, which is to say A depends on nothing but crisply or flatly. B depends on X flatly, that is B's use of X is in the special context to the left of the bar here. On the other hand, C's use of X is special, but Y is normal is marked, right? The fact that Y is over on this side of the bar, whereas X is on this side of the bar is marked in the fact that here we have an F around the X, but we don't have an F around the Y. So by using the algebraic structure of context here, we can demark uses of variables that are supposed to be from this context from uses of variables that are supposed to be from this context by giving different uh, terms over here for them. Okay. And so what that tells us is that by giving mode constants and mode terms, we can describe the judgment structure for left adjoints. And so then what we're going to do is we're going to introduce a general notion of type where that general notion of type will allow me to say types that have left universal properties relative to the context and right universal properties. So, um, to describe that general notion of type, it's useful to go from the kind of concrete semantics in CAT that we had here, where we had categories, functors, and natural transformations, to thinking about the base as any two category, and then the types as what we call a local discrete vibration over it. And then the types, I'll just give you a sketch for them. There's going to be these left adjoint types that represent the products or the flat. There's going to be these right adjoint types that represent the sharp or pi types, or arrow types, stuff like that, are going to be what we'll call F and U types, which will be Cartesian or op Cartesian lifts with respect to this vibration. So the picture to have in mind is that if you have something in the base, then the F type for that is the best approximation of A over here living over Q. And so it has a universal property relative to that. And so I don't expect you to read these, but you can write down rules that in general describe that situation. And then for the U types, we're going to do something where you have a uh, Cartesian lift. That is, if you have something over here, you can pull it back over here to get a type over Q, except it's going to have some extra parameters over here. And the extra parameters over here will let us put in pi types as an instance of this sort of thing. So you can think of the A here as the domain of the pi. So the U is sort of the best thing that has a map to B over F when put next to a P over here. Okay, and there's type theory rules here for that kind of situation too. So again, I don't expect you to read these, but right now, but you can give rules that in general describe this situation. And so then just to give a flavor for what it looks like to pilot this framework, when you put in sigma types, what you do, remember for left adjoint types, you put in some extra stuff in the mode theory in the base, and then you define them to be types with a universal property relative to that is that we're going to put in sigma types by saying there's a type constructor that takes types dependent on A and a type dependent on A dot X and gives you a type dependent on A. We'll call that sigma one. And then we're going to set things up such that the comprehension of A dot sigma one is the same as A dot X dot Y iterated, right? Which is something you're hopefully familiar with from seeing sigma types in a category with families or something like that. And so then 
the point is that the sigma types are going to be defined to be the F types, the instance of this general pattern of type for this particular data that we've put into the algebraic signature for the modal type theory. And then when we get to pi's, we're going to need an extra condition that the unit types are stable under weakening for the way we're currently doing things. And then if you do that, then you can represent pi types by a U type for the projection. So remember pi was notation for the projection operation from an extended context to the context that it extended, which is to say that we're getting pi's as the right adjoint to weakening, which you might expect from hyperdoctrines or something like that. And so then when we get to modal type theory, what we do just to give a flavor for it is, well, we define this structure of a comprehension object and we can talk about maps between comprehension objects as, well, if a comprehension object is a type and then a type over it and another type, another one is a type and another type over it, then we have a map along the base from P to Q and then we have a map from T to S over it. And then we're gonna ask that F1 laxly preserves one because that's what we happen to need in the way we're currently doing things. And so then a morphism of comprehension objects will support left adjoint types if, well, applying the context modality to A dot X is the same as applying the context modality to A and then extending that with F1. And it's going to support right adjoint types if, again, F strict, uh, strongly preserves one rather than weakly for the way we're encoding things right now. That happens to be the condition that we need. And so then given these conditions, we can represent right adjoint types again as this general instance of a U type, which we gave rules for once and for all. And we can represent left adjoint types for this as a instance of this general notion of F types, which we gave rules for once and for all. And so then, for example, when we come to spatial type theory, what we need is additionally that uh, we have the operation on context to be an idempotent comonad like we talked about before. And then in that case, there's a definition of a flat type and a sharp type. So the sharp is just the right adjoint and the flat combines the left adjoint with the comult using an operation that we haven't had time to talk about, but you can do that. Okay, so all told what you get then is something where the right adjoint types interpret the rules for dependent right adjoints that you might have seen in the paper on modal dependent type theory and dependent right adjoints by Lars Berkedal and company. And the left adjoints uh, interpret rules for left adjoints that fall out of the framework, which are kind of dual to those. And then if you have spatial type theory, you additionally have some substitutions for the co-unit of the comalt. And then we've shown that you can translate Shulman's optimized rules into this set more algebraic setting here. So the big picture is that we've given a theory in the framework that consisted of axioms for the structure of dependent type theory with these uh, modalities. And then out of that, we can derive these rules here uh, and then translate the optimized rules into them. Okay, in the big picture, what we're working on, so I kind of give you just a hint of the semantics there. In general, the semantics that we're working on is something called a local discrete vibration of two categories with families. And the two-ness is the fact that M here needs these two cells to represent transformations between the contexts that is the co-unit of a comonad or some, uh, for example. And then there's still some stuff that we're still kind of trying to figure out about this. So not everything's totally settled. We've currently got uh, translations of ordinary dependent type theory into the framework of dependent right adjoints into the framework of spatial type theory into the framework of uh, linear dependent type theory or linearly dependently indexed linear type theory into the framework. But they use, for example, some stricter F types that we're trying to figure out if they're semantically sensible or if there's something else that we should be doing. And there's other issues that I didn't have time to get to today, like the fact that the top F and U types, these general patterns are asserted to be strictly stable under substitution in the same way that pi's and sigma's in a normal dependent type theory are asserted to be strictly stable under substitution. And we're currently considering whether some of that strictness should also be part of the axioms for the constants that generate these types or whether we can do some strictification to the things that are uh, maybe laxly or uh, strongly stable in the base in order to get these strict types up here and also extending the semantics to with vibrancy for homotopy models.
Okay, so the pattern that I hope you'll take away from this, if you didn't follow all the details, I know there was a ton of notation there, is that when you're thinking about designing a modal type theory, what you should think about is putting in new judgments for the left adjoints, putting in left adjoint types with a left universal property relative to them, right adjoint types with a right universal property relative to them, putting in structural rules as substitutions or natural transformations between them. And then once you've got the algebra sorted out, trying to figure out how to rearrange the structural rules into convenient locations to make a nice usable thing. And the way this plays out in this general framework we've designed is that you put in mode types and mode terms, which are giving the axioms for the left adjoints. And then there's a general notion of left adjoint or F type or op Cartesian lift and right adjoint or U type or Cartesian lift that gives you, for example, uh, flat types and uh, uh, sigma types as instances of the F types and gives you pi types and sharp types as instances of the right adjoints. And then you can get put in the structural rules as these two cells between terms. And then from all of that, do calculations inside the framework to prove that the rules you would expect hold for those things. So that's the pattern that we're trying to encode in this. And then what we hope we'll be able to get out of this is a general categorical semantics for a class of modal type theories where you can find the expected semantic structures as instances of models of spatial type theory or models of other variations on that, and maybe try to implement a proof assistant with enough automation where if you come up with a new situation or somebody you know, walks up to you and says, I really need these modalities to talk about super homotopy theory, then we can easily come up with rules for that inside of a single proof assistant and get a usable system for that. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Dan. Um, I will unmute everyone, so I'll thank Dan. Okay, are there any questions? I will start with one to get the ball rolling. Um, so basically on this last slide, I think you, you said some of this, but I'm just curious how far along you are, say towards a hope of some kind of initiality result or something like that. So we have ideas. So there's some notes on GitHub that I'll put a pointer to, but uh, we have ideas about this idea of uh, doing the semantics as a locally discrete vibration of two categories with families. And um, like, so I think what Mike's got so far is he's defined the setting, but hasn't defined uh, what it means to have F and U types. And then there's additional, these issues of the fact that we're using some stricter F types and other things like that, that we have to sort out. But I think we have a pretty good picture of how the semantics is going to go. Once we have the semantics set up, I don't think, doing initiality for the syntax to the semantics is any easier or harder than doing it for like a normal dependent type theory, which is to say that, you know, nobody usually wants to do it, but you could kind of look at the two things on both sides and see that it might hold. Um, I think, yeah, that's what we've got so far. We're kind of also, there's been a lot of feedback in the sense that like, we try a translation of dependent type theory into it using some feature in the syntax that we think should exist. And then maybe we discover that in the semantics, it's too strict to assume that you have left adjoints to every mode morphism or something like that, that work in a particular way. And so then we have to go back and try it again. So there's been a few iterations of this. So hopefully we'll converge on one that works both syntactically and semantically pretty soon. Other questions? So I have a question. This is coming out in your preprint that you're going to release soon, or have you released it? Um, I mean, it's on GitHub if anybody's super it's excited to read it right now before we totally have our story straight, um, or I'll you know, release it once we totally have our story straight. <laughs> so yeah, I can post a link to the current version of the notes if anybody wants to read it right now. <laughs> 
Um, so how about the, uh, this idea of a proof assistant? Yeah, mm -hmm. You probably haven't started that, but do you have any idea whether you'd build on some existing framework or how that might work? Yeah, I mean, so the thing is, the, I mean, if you remember back to, uh, so let me find the picture. Yeah, so like back to this picture, right? So we're sort of annotating each judgment of the type theory with some extra information. And so it seems like it might be possible to take, say, Agda or something like that and put this in, but it's not a straightforward in, uh, kind of extension because you're really kind of touching the basic fabric of what it means to be a context and what it means to be a type and what it means to be a term there. So it might be easier to implement a prototype that just lets you do little derivations in spatial type theory or something as an experiment first to get some familiarity with that. I think we'd also want, uh, maybe Agda wouldn't be the best choice, maybe Lean or Red TT or something like that, where there's more support for tactics built in. Because when I think about wanting to automate this stuff so that when you write down a particular modal type theory, you then get the convenient rules, like the actual rules for flat that Moik wrote down, um, then like this idea of optimizing the placement of the structural rules by computing derived rules, that does seem like a good use for tactics to me because you're going to want to move these two cells that tell you which structural rules exist, like the co-unit or the uh, weakening or things like that around the terms automatically with a tactic rather than doing it by hand. I'm sure there's some more questions. Are there any current stumbling blocks? Um, the, let's see. I don't know if there's stumbling blocks. So we've got two different translations of Martin Luff type theory into the framework. They use different, uh, oops, sorry. They use different, uh, all right, I up out of slideshow mode here. They use different features in the syntax and um, we're trying to figure out whether one or both or something like them can be interpreted in the semantics that we have in mind, particularly when we take into account wanting to have some notion of vibrant types like in homotopy models. So I think one of the translations definitely works, I think in uh, uh, like the semantics in cat that I was mentioning on one of the slides, but the how to integrate that with having a notion of vibrant types. So for example, we should be, if we're thinking of the F types as sigma types in the sense that you're used to them or as these left adjunct mod modalities, then those want to be like the vibrant replacement of some underlying thing because they're supposed to turn out to be vibrant. And so they get the usual things that vibrant thing, vibrant, vibrantly replaced types get, like they have an introduction rule and an induction principle and a beta rule, but no strict eta. And so making sure that our approach is compatible with that is the thing that we've been talking about most over the past week or so. Next question. Uncomfortable silence is the best way to draw out questions, I'm told. Um, so one thing I was wondering is, um, so one might be interested in the type theory for uh, co-monad or monad or other functors which are not adjoints. So yeah. does the framework um, right. elucidate how to do that? Yeah, so I mean, if you go to, yeah, that's a great question. So if you go to, let me find my one copy of my pattern slide here, yeah. So when you're putting in the judgment for the left adjoints, right? So like I phrased it as left adjoint and then the left adjoint types have a left universal property relative to that judgment. And then the right adjoint types have a right universal property. Well, if you leave off the right adjoints, there's no commitment that you have all of the right adjoint, all of the U types to everything. And if you leave off the just don't assert that you have a right adjoint, then it behaves like just a functor rather than a left adjoint. But for my story in the talk, it was easier to talk about them as left adjoints. The one thing you have to be careful of there is that depending on how you set up the rules for something like co-products or inductive types in the framework, if you know that all of your F types are left adjoints, then you might bake into the rules, for example, that left adjoints preserve co-products. 
but if you know that you're not going to have some, you're going to have some F types that are not left adjoints, they're just types with a universal property relative to a mode morphism in the base, then you uh, want to make sure that you set up the rules for additive types in such a way that it's compatible with that so that you can only eliminate them when you're, you don't accidentally make them preserve, make the modalities preserve coproducts. And so that's this idea of the interactions between the modalities and, and inductive types or higher inductive types, things like that, that we still have to consider. How about encoding things like universes or higher inductive types? Can, can framework handle those? I mean, it's not, it's kind of orthogonal to the kinds of the F and the U types here. So the F and the U types are really capturing this pattern of an F type is like flat or like the monoid in a substructural logic or something like that. Something that the rules for it are a product in a generalized sense relative to the context. And the U types are types that like pi or right adjoints on the, when you're trying to prove them, put something, do something to the context. And so universes don't have that flavor and uh, higher inductive types don't have that flavor, right? They're different kinds of types. So we would also want to you know, think about what, whether they mean anything in general without specifying what particular type theory you're in. But I don't currently think that they would look that different than they do the way you put them in normally, which is sort of more axiomatic than as part of the proof theory. Can you talk some more about the semantics? For example, how do you get the substitution to be strict? Um, well, we haven't yet, so not yet. Um, but the idea is that the hope is that what we can do is apply, uh, for example, like a global universe or local universe kind of strictification in general. So the idea is that you would start from a mode theory that says some lack stability under substitution or some uh, strong in the sense of isomorphism stability under substitution. And then in general, we could build the F types for that and the U types for that by doing one of the known strictification techniques. But that's still to be worked out. Any more questions? Do you have any uh, surprising examples or modalities? Well, the framework doesn't really help you come up with new modalities in the sense that like you specify a modality by giving some, by essentially giving a syntax in the base type theory that denotes the intended semantics. So you have to have the semantics in mind. I think the most surprising modality that I know of is this one that we've been working on with Eric Finster. Um, Mitchell Riley and Ed Morehouse and I have been working on where you have the uh, self adjoint flat sharp where you can think of a model of that. Actually, Ulrich uh, Buchholz just mentioned one of the models of that in his talk at CMU last week that's online. And so that's pointed spaces. That is, you can think of a type in the base. Uh, you can think of a context as representing a type and then a dependent type over it, which has a section and then maps there, maps that preserve the section. So it's sort of a generalization of uh, pointed maps there. And so that one's kind of neat because you have a self-adjoint modality, which gives you some extra structure. So for example, if you know that uh, flat and sharp are the same, uh, then since sharp is a monad and has a unit, and that's the same as flat, which is a co-monad and has a co-unit. By composing those, you get a non-trivial endomap on every type, which is this thing that was killing the spectra in the example that I showed earlier in the talk. So that one's kind of fun, and we're kind of trying to right now use the framework to come up with a nice type theory, optimized type theory for that situation. Okay, last call for questions. So as I understand it, the modalities that we talk about in homotopy type theory generally tend to be idempotent. So this framework is more general than that? Yeah, so the modalities that we talk about in the sense of the hot book are what I would now call idempotent monadic modalities. And so you can consider things that are not 
monadic, but then more generally, you can consider things that are, um, sorry, you can consider things that are not idempotent, but also a big part of the picture these days is these co-monadic modalities like flat, which are just, you know, kind of, in some sense, the dual thing. And then beyond that, a lot of the action is in asserting modalities with different natural transformations. So different, so there's functors, but they have different, you know, different natural transformations giving them different properties. So, so does that include reflective subuniverses that might not even be a modality at all? Uh, it hopefully would. I mean, it wouldn't be a modality in the sense of the hot book. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, yeah, I mean, one of the things that we haven't yet thought about in general is how you would give a general way for saying how the modalities interact with identity types, for example. So, we, so for reflective subuniverses, is it sigmas or identity types that they don't necessarily preserve? Like um, what's... The, the sigma of a, of a local map doesn't have to be local. Right, yeah. So like that kind of interaction is hopefully something we could say with a version of that framework, mm -hmm. of the framework, yeah. Okay, another last call. Okay. Right, here's a bit of a nonsense question. Um, stabilization uh, in homotopy theory, you know, you can have the mm -hmm infinity suspension and the infinity loop. If you, that would be like a left, right adjoint. I'm thinking, I don't know, it's not very well questioned, but would that be the sort of modality that would fit in? Well, so understand what I'm saying? I, think, I think maybe so. That kind of thing, I would say, falls into the category of things where, I mean, they are adjoint, right? But like they're adjoint as pointed like it in pointed spaces if I remember correctly and so that kind of thing we can already define them inside of Bacot and we can give their universal properties and we can prove that they're adjoint and it's not entirely clear to me that you would want to that you would gain anything by taking that kind of internal definition and trying to turn it into new rules in the type theory instead because you don't want to just know that there is a pair of adjoint things with certain, you know, judgmental natural transformations relationships between them. What you want to know is that one of those things is the actual identity type and the other of those things is the actual hit for suspension and things like that. So in those circumstances where we can already work with them easily in a interpreted fashion, I don't think the framework does something for you. It's situations like cohesion where we want to put in these uninterpreted functors, which mean you know, lots of different things and lots of different models where you'd use this kind of technology. Okay, I think it's uh, time to thank Dan again. Okay, so that's it for today. Um, Sorry, you're all there. Sorry, I think everyone's muted. That's it for today. Uh, our next talk will be by Joachim Koch in two weeks. I uh, hope to see you all then.